Hey, Pretty Girl Club. So today I want to talk about privilege stacking strategies for women who have pretty privilege. Um, this video is going to focus on social climbing and why I believe that every girl who has pretty privilege should do everything in her power to become as wealthy as possible. Because one thing that I've noticed is that when people perceive you as having more privilege than them, they will do everything in their power to tear you down. And I've noticed, I've noticed that this is very common in the workplace. Um, a lot of people who didn't achieve their dreams in life spend 30, 40, and 50 years working jobs that they hate. And so oftentimes when they see you, and maybe you are young, or maybe you're just beautiful, and you are still filled with hope, maybe you still have a sense of confidence, and your life doesn't revolve around work, um, when people encounter that, you remind them of what they used to be and you remind them of all of the missed opportunities in their life. And so because of this dynamic, I feel like a lot of people subconsciously want to sabotage you because they want you to be as miserable as them. And they're not, they're not even doing it on purpose. They're not even trying to be an evil person, but misery loves company. And I've noticed that a lot of people have the crabs in a bucket mentality and they don't even realize it. One of the ways that this manifests is, for example, let's say you work some shitty job and then you got a new job and then people are like, oh no, don't leave. You need to stay here. Like we need you here. They don't realize that by saying that they're actually gaslighting and like keeping you down basically because it's like, wait a minute, I just got a better job. You should be happy that I'm moving on to something that is better for me. But have you ever noticed that when you quit a job, people don't care that you are doing something that's best for you. They just care about the fact that now they don't have anyone to do their work. Now they don't have anyone to push work tasks onto. And I know that I experienced this when I had my job before I went full-time being a content creator, I was an accountant. And basically multiple people in my department quit. And so for accounting, that's very like hard. You know, it, you can't, it's not very easy to replace someone in a department like that. And my accounting department, they also were doing things with like payroll and stuff. So it's like a very big deal. Like literally people are not going to get paid. Like vendors won't get paid or employees will not get paid and money will not be in bank accounts if we are not doing the work. So I remember people used to push a lot of tasks on me and one by one, people in the department started quitting because you know they were tired of being overworked and underpaid. So I remember like one by one with each person quitting, my job became more and more difficult. Um, my job tasks became worse and worse because one thing that a lot of companies don't tell you is like when one person quits, that work doesn't go anywhere. They're not like, okay, we're just going to erase that work. No, that work is just going to be dispersed amongst the people who are left. And I've noticed that when you are the pretty girl in the workplace or when people view you as having more privilege or when they associate your beauty with being soft or they perceive you as someone who's living the soft life, people will subconsciously try to make your job harder. That is one thing that I've noticed over and over again. Anytime you go into the workplace and you come off as you're living the soft life, people are automatically going to push their tasks onto you because they assume, oh, well, she has a positive attitude. She can handle it. Or, well, she needs a little bit more work. You know, she's not really doing much, so she'll be fine. And I've noticed that a lot of people, they love to use the workplace as a way to almost humble you if you are the girl who is on your level up journey. And I've noticed that a lot of people, they perceive you as being mentally stronger because you are on a level up journey and they can see the fact that your life doesn't revolve around work. And so because of that, they think it's okay to then push all of those tasks onto you. And so one of the main reasons why I talk so much about the concept of privilege stacking and social climbing and using your beauty or your talents and your skills to isolate yourself from situations like this. The reason I talk about that is because I genuinely do feel like a lot of women, they lose their beauty, they lose their youth, and they lose their physical health because they spend so much time sacrificing for others. And it's like, if we're not doing it in relationships, then we end up doing it in the workplace or we end up doing it for our children. And this channel is really just focused on you taking back your own power and you taking back ownership of your own life. And part of how you take ownership of your own life is by taking ownership over your time. And so one thing I've noticed is that a lot of people in the millennial generation or in generations before that, like Generation X and the boomers and stuff, they tried to put pressure on us and make us think that 
the only way to make money or the best way to make money is if you are working a traditional nine to five office job. I noticed that people, they like to shit on service jobs. They like to shit on like bartending jobs or jobs where you're not working during the day. So basically these nighttime jobs and part-time jobs. But I actually encourage all of the girls on their level up journey to do a job schedule that works best for you so that you can spend more time leveling up. So if that means quitting this job that you have now and maybe going to a part-time job that is like less serious or it doesn't require as much of your mental energy and then you want to focus more of your energy on doing other things like making your Etsy shop, making your YouTube channel, creating your um, Shopify store and stuff like that or writing books. I feel like it is always worth it because one thing I've noticed is that if you are already pretty privileged and you do not achieve your dreams, Somebody is going to relish in the fact that they get to be in the midst of a pretty woman and others will relish in the fact that they get to take advantage of you or that they have power over you. Have you ever noticed how a lot of basic Bettys in the workplace, they love to flex their management positions on the pretty girl? Like let's say you're the pretty girl who works at a coffee shop inside of an office building. A lot of the really mean ladies who are like old and shit or they're like all depressed or whatever, a lot of the basic Bettys, they will try to be extra rude to you or let's say you just started in a new office or something. A lot of the people who have been there for a long time and they just hate their own lives, they will try to project their own unhappiness onto you. And so I genuinely believe that pretty girls have to social climb for their own safety because a lot of people associate beauty with success. Think about it. Every single one of the most famous celebrities, they are conventionally attractive. Um, a lot of people who are wealthy, they hang out with conventionally attractive women. They tend to marry women who are conventionally attractive or they fit popular beauty standards such as having clear skin, smooth, uh, perfect teeth and stuff, or maybe they're a little bit thinner or their hair is professionally done. So a lot of people will subconsciously associate your beauty with being successful. And so one of the things I've noticed is that people don't want you to leave proximity to them. They don't want you to leave that job. They don't want you to leave the hood. They want you to stay where they are because it makes them feel more successful. It makes them feel like less of a loser to be working at the same place as this pretty girl. It makes them feel like less of a loser um, that they live in the hood when all of these really pretty girls who are very classy live in the same neighborhood as them. But what that does is that actually hinders you. And I've noticed some people will even go as far as trying to um, get you to be more down to earth or they will try to make you prove how humble you are. So for example, if you don't really like hanging out in the hood, then you get called bougie. So people are trying to manipulate you into staying at the bottom so that they don't feel as bad about their life situation. But one of the ways that I started to social climb outside of just doing a nine to five is I really had to, number one, switch up my schedule. And number two, I would utilize my sick days. So you know how at some offices they give you a certain amount of times you can call in sick. So I would call in sick even if I wasn't sick. And on those days that I called in sick, I would work on my YouTube channel or just do like taking care of business that was um, going to help me level up. So for some of you, that could be your weight loss journey. Maybe you need to call in sick and have a mental health day so you can go on a hike or something. Or maybe you need to call in or come into work late one day so that you can start your meal prepping for the week and you can kind of get on track with your diet and stuff. One thing I've learned is that like, Nobody really gives a fuck about your life. You're the one who has to wake up with yourself in the morning. You're the one who has to look in the mirror and time is going to pass you by either way. So for a lot of the people that doubted me with like being on YouTube and stuff, people would make comments like, oh, well, you know, what if your channel gets deleted or what if like YouTube goes away or whatever? And it's like, I can make the same argument about your nine to five job. What if you get fired? What if they change the policy and now your job is like a different job description? What if they don't promote you? Or, you know, five years from now, you are only making uh, a fraction of what you should be making. What if they do not give you a raise? And by the way, I'm not trying to say that like everybody should quit their nine to five jobs because I do think that there are some people who love doing their nine to fives. I know my mom, she really likes her nine to five. So if it's fulfilling to you and you genuinely are like, oh my God, I love this. This is great. Then you should keep doing it. And if your job is helping you to attain your social climbing goals, then you should do it. But that's another thing that I've had to think about is what are my goals socially? So 
For example, with me, my social climbing goals are I really want to increase my socioeconomic status. I want to have both money and time because I've noticed that in the past, I've only had one or the other. And, and one of my main social climbing goals is to have both. I feel like it's a luxury to have money and then to also have a lot of free time. So for me, it did mean getting out of a nine to five because, you know, they tell you what time to wake up, like what time to come into work and stuff, what time you can leave. But that was one of my social climbing goals because I noticed that it was a trigger for me. Like it was basically a depression trigger to have this monotonous schedule where it's like, oh crap, I can't like do the things that I want to do. And it was to the point where when it came to me working on this YouTube channel, I would be staying up until 11 p.m. editing or, you know, staying up really late editing and stuff and trying to get videos uploaded. And then I would be super tired when I got to work the next day. And then my actual work would suffer at my job. And then, you know, now I've got the managers breathing down my neck or kind of like watching me and stuff. So you get to decide what you want to do with your life. And the reason that I bring up pretty privilege is because any privileges that you were born with can be utilized to help you attain what you want. So a lot of people, they like to talk shit and say, well, no, you shouldn't be using your privileges. And it's like, well, that's idiotic. Like, what am I supposed to do? Live my life in poverty in order to prove to random strangers on the internet that I have solidarity with underprivileged people? No, the same people who don't want you to use your privileges are the same people that would trade places with you if they could. They love talking shit about women who have pretty privilege or women who have all of these, I don't know, white privilege privilege, light skin privilege, mixed privilege, whatever. But those same people, they they will go and marry a white person. They will switch places with that person if they could. They are doing everything in their power to look prettier. They're doing everything in their power to look like a mixed race person or to attain those same privileges. So I no longer listen to people who try to lie. And the reason that people are saying that is because they're just lying to keep you in your place. They're lying so that you do not become their competition. They're lying so that behind the scenes they can like get ahead of you because I remember that's exactly what happened to me. People would tell me, oh, you don't need makeup or you don't need weaves and you shouldn't wear that. You don't need to do all of these beauty enhancements. And the same people that were telling me not to do them, they would be doing all the beauty enhancements and like slaying and like flexing on everybody and getting all of these benefits. The same guys that would say, you don't need to wear makeup. I don't want any makeup. Don't nobody want to see no makeup. The same guys that would say that shit are over here jacking off to women with makeup. They are crushing on and liking Instagram photos and, you know, making all of those women's pages go up in the algorithm because of their makeup. So anytime somebody says things like looks don't matter or using privileges, that's wrong and you shouldn't use anything you have to get ahead in life, those people are liars. Those people feel like they are at the bottom of society and they want you to be at the bottom. They want you to actually be beneath them and a part of their strategy on how to hinder their social competition is by telling you, oh, you're good right where you are. Don't go anywhere. You don't need to do any of that stuff. You don't need to pursue anything better. You don't need to level up. So I just ignore those people because it's my life. And the way that I like to see it is when I was a little girl, what did I want to become? Would my kindergarten version of myself be proud of me like when I was a little girl and I was dreaming and before I had all of these traumas telling me oh you can't do this you can't do that you're a person of color you have to work twice as hard to get half as much you'll always reach a glass ceiling the white man will always be higher than you before all of those traumas and projections were placed upon me what were my dreams and as far as the life that I'm living today would my seven-year-old self be happy with that? Would she think that that's cool? Or does she feel like she has been neglected? Because what I've noticed is that a lot of women are neglecting their inner child. They are neglecting the little girl inside of themselves. Um, so they're not allowing themselves to dress like a princess. They don't allow themselves to dress up. They don't allow themselves to be playful anymore. They don't allow themselves to dream or to explore the world and to have a sense of novelty in their life because they have neglected their inner child. And this is where you get a lot of the bitter Bettys in the workplace. These are women who have spent decades neglecting themselves. These are the women who work extra hours at work without getting paid and without getting rewarded. And so when they see you privilege stacking and getting rewarded by society, then they get mad about it. And by the way, when it comes to pretty privilege, 
there are so many different ways that you can use your beauty to your advantage. So that's another thing that I had to think about. Like, how do I want to use my beauty? What is my beauty good for? Do I want to use it just to attract a man? Do I want to use it so I can social climb amongst men? Um, do I want to use it to social climb amongst women? Because one thing that people don't talk about is a lot of women will actually use their beauty to social climb amongst other women. So anytime a woman tries to make fun of you, let's say you're wearing, I don't know, a beauty enhancement. Let's say you're wearing a push-up bra or something and somebody calls you out and says, that's a push-up bra, your, your boobs are fake. She's actually trying to use her natural beauty to flex on you. She's trying to social climb above you. That's why she's calling out your enhancement because she views it as you're cheating if you're using any of these enhancements. But the way that I like to view beauty enhancements is it can be utilized as a form of privilege stacking because you have more versatility. So you can decide one day, I wanna have blonde highlights and then the next day you're back to black. And then you can kind of experiment more. But some women, they use their pretty privilege to social climb amongst women um, because they want to be seen as the pretty friend or maybe they want to be seen as the queen bee of the group. I have actually noticed a lot of social climbing tactics that women use in friendships. So for example, maybe you have a friend who she is like the fitness guru. She likes to be known as the fitness guru of the group. She likes to be the one that tells everybody advice on like, no, this is how you're supposed to lift weights. This is how you're supposed to do X, Y, Z. And one thing I've learned is that every woman wants to feel like the alpha female or the girl boss or whatever in at least one area of their life. And there's actually nothing wrong with that. Um, I don't have a problem with wanting to feel dominant or wanting to feel like you are kind of the queen or like you're a princess. There's nothing wrong with having main character energy, but you get to decide for yourself, how do I want to utilize my privileges? How do I want a social climb? Because I've had friends myself where it's like, if I start diving into a hobby that that is kind of like their thing, then they will become threatened. So for example, let's say I have a friend that does yoga and then I become really good at yoga and I'm doing all these poses. I'm posting pictures of myself doing all these cool poses and stuff. And then she feels like yoga is her thing. So now she's trying to nitpick me or trying to compete with me in terms of yoga. Women actually do these types of things. And I just used yoga as an example, but some of the common ways that I've seen women uh, try to social climb amongst other women is they will do it via relationships. For example, I'm married, this is my man, my man, my man, and then all their friends are single, so they will flex their relationships. Some women will try to use their career or their money, um, maybe their education, like if they have a degree, if they have a doctorate. By the way, none of these privileges are bad. I'm not like throwing shade at any of them. I just think that what really matters is how you use it. But for some women, they wanna be known for their education and the question that I had to ask myself is what do I want to be known for like as far as social climbing goes so what legacy would I want to leave when I'm gone what would I want people to remember me as how do I want people to remember me how would I define my personality how do I want to express my personality one thing that I learned about myself recently is that I'm actually very creative to the point where I really care a lot about having creative control over my own life um, I've noticed that that aspect is true in every part of my life. Any area that involves creativity, I like to be able to express my creativity freely. So this is why, for example, on some of the Decentering Men videos, you will literally hear me complain that some of these women are living in houses where 50% of the decorations are ugly. And that's because for me personally, I like having creative freedom. That is one of my core values. That is something that I really care about. So same thing with why I'm so pro beauty enhancement because ever since decentering men, I no longer feel the need to try to impress men with my natural beauty because I know that natural beauty doesn't change his character. It doesn't mean he's not going to cheat. It doesn't mean that he's going to somehow become this virtuous man. So now I like to exercise creative freedom over my beauty. And then I've noticed that the same is true for me when it comes to my work. I like to be able to be creative with how I make my money. And so that's why I decided that like the nine to five office jobs and stuff didn't work for me because I didn't get to use my creativity. Anytime I would speak up in meetings like, oh, hey, um, why don't we do X, Y, Z? Like, why don't we try to do it this way? Other people would be like, no, because we've always done it this other way. So like, we're not changing it.
But that was when I realized that one of my social climbing goals is to be able to have creative freedom in every area of my life. So being able to be creative with my beauty, be creative with my living space, and even be creative with making money and making content online. So I'm talking about that because getting to know yourself is going to be a really big part of your social climbing goals. And by the way, um, when I call it social climbing, what I really mean is how do you want to be seen in society? Where do you want to, for lack of better words, where do you want to rank in society? Um, for example, where do you want to rank socioeconomically? Do you care about wealth or are you one of those people who's more of a minimalist where you're like, oh no, I can just, you know, live on $20,000 a year and be happy. So where do you want to rank? What part of society do you like? Um, do you like living in the city? Do you like living in the country or the suburbs? Maybe you thrive more in a small town. There are some women who they thrive more in small towns because it vibes well with their personality. So maybe they like big open spaces and they really like gardening and they like not having to get glammed up all the time and they like having a lot of privacy. And so they thrive in a small town or they really like nature. They like the fact that they can go off the grid and stuff and how people aren't so glued to their phones. That is a part of their social climbing journey. They want to thrive in that part of society. So when I use the term social climbing, what I'm really saying is what part of society do you thrive in? What is the lane that you can be in where you get to be the Beyonce of that lane? Because Sorry, I, I just have to bring up the Kelly Beyonce thing again, because one thing I've noticed with the Kelly Beyonce dynamic is how sometimes it seems like Kelly is living in Beyonce's world as opposed to creating her own world where she thrives, where she's the queen of it, she's the star of it, and she's only focused on herself. And so one thing that I've learned is that if I have a boss at a job telling me what to do and like dictating to me what I should do, I can't thrive in that long term. I notice I do not work well with people trying to like tell me what to do and stuff. Yes, I would rather be poor. I would I would rather deliver pizzas and be able to be my own boss than to have some bitch ass basic Betty bossing me around and telling me what to do and humiliating me. Because in my past, I would like cry and stuff at jobs. Um, like if somebody would yell at me, I used to get like really, really heated and upset if I was doing a lot of work and then, you know, I wasn't getting a raise or wasn't getting recognized and stuff like that. So that's another thing that I've noticed is important for me personally. In my social climbing journey, I want to be recognized. I want recognition for my creativity that I talked about a second ago. So I like um, the concept of being recognized and I don't have to personally be recognized but I like it when my work is recognized. So that's why doing a like a faceless YouTube channel works for me because my work is being recognized. I don't have to personally, you know, be famous or whatever. I don't care so much about the whole fame part, but I notice that I do care about money and I care about being creative and I care about my creativity being recognized. So it's all about self-awareness. And by the way, that was no shade to Kelly Rowland a second ago. I was just trying to use her as an example because I feel like part of her problem is maybe she feels like she is not recognized for her work. But the question is, what is she trying to be recognized for? Does she want to be recognized for her creativity, for her vocal skills, for her acting skills? I don't know. I don't know what her true passions are. So I'm using it as an example to say that is something that you'll have to ask yourself on your journey. Like, what are my true passions? If I could think of the happiest way to like live my life, what would it be? And the first question I asked myself is like, if money didn't exist, what would I be doing with my time? And the answer was, I would be talking shit. I'd be talking shit on YouTube and I'd be getting paid to talk shit. And for other people, it could be maybe you really love baking. Maybe you like singing. Maybe you like playing the guitar. You like working with children. So finding whatever your passions are, that is also going to be important to your social climbing journey because then you know what mountain you're climbing. You know what you're trying to get to. You know where your destination is. But another thing that I mean when I use the term social climbing is where do you socialize the best? Um, where do you thrive socially? Do you thrive when you are not socializing a lot? Because I noticed that I like to socialize, but I am not the type of person that needs to be like, I don't need to be like a Beyonce or somebody like that, like with paparazzi and all that, red carpets and stuff. I don't necessarily need that. 
Um, but I do like socializing online. I like socializing in my everyday life, uh, going to different workout classes and stuff. So that's another question that you can ask yourself is where do I thrive socially? Oh, another area where I thrive socially is I thrive in a multicultural, multiracial environment. I thrive the most in a diverse environment. So I need to be around black people, white people, Asian people. Like I need a, a good diverse mix. I can't be around too much of a monocultural environment because I noticed that's not where I thrive socially. But for some people, you do thrive socially in a monocultural environment. Maybe you thrive the most when you are around the Latin American community. Maybe you thrive the most in the black community. You thrive the most in the white community. You thrive the most when you are in higher socioeconomic settings. I've noticed that that is another area where I thrive a lot. I do not thrive in settings of poverty. Um, and no shade, by the way, to people who are like poor. I don't, I'm not rich at all, but I don't really thrive as much socially when I go to restaurants in the ghetto and like all of my shopping is done in the ghetto and then I live in the ghetto. I don't thrive as much in those types of areas. I tend to thrive socially in more of a diverse uh, major metropolitan city environment. I also don't thrive in the suburbs because the suburbs for me represent too much stability. Uh, that's the best way I can describe it. The suburbs, that's where I was raised. So the nine to five lifestyle, I feel like that goes along with the suburbs perfectly. Being a professional, you know, working in an office or something, maybe having a business or something, um, being married, having kids. So suburban lifestyle, that doesn't, I don't thrive socially in those environments because I tend to be more, I guess, free spirited and carefree. I just will cause chaos in those types of environments. I'll get very bored. I don't want to just live in a big empty house. I don't even care about living in a big house. That's another thing. Um, when it comes to your living situation, what types of living environments do you thrive in socially? I do not thrive living in a roommate situation. That is not how I thrive socially when it comes to my living environment. Um, I also don't thrive in a suburban situation because I don't want a big ass house where I have to like pay someone to mow the lawn and all that. I have to like do all this stuff to make sure I don't get uh, fined by the HOA and all that. I don't really thrive in that. I thrive more in a city type of situation. So yes, I am one of those people who likes to live in a box. <laughs> yes, I will live in a small apartment. I've lived in studio apartments before or like high rises and stuff like that. That is more so where I thrive. I like to be able to walk out of my front door and I am on the street or, you know, I walk downstairs, I walk out of my building and I'm on the street in the middle of the city. That is where I thrive socially. So when I say social climbing, that's what I'm thinking about. Like what environments do you interact in the best and how can you stack your privileges up to tailor your life around those types of environments you want to be in? For some people, they thrive socially living in their hometowns. I am horrible at just only living in one place for my entire life. I cannot imagine myself having lived in my hometown all this time. I would have gone insane. But there are other people who thrive socially when they are in a very predictable environment. And by the way, there's no wrong answer. One is not better than the other. But that's what I mean when I use the term social climb. It's gonna be different for each person. It's not just about getting a man or like trying to have a hypergamous marriage or whatever. There are so many different aspects to social climbing and it has to do with who you are in society, how you interact with society, what parts of society do you like, what parts of society do you dislike. And there is no shame, like there's no wrong answer. I personally, I like the bougie part of society. I really do. I like the concept of, you know, being in a classy environment, being in these nice restaurants and stuff, or being in areas where you do kind of have to dress up more and people are not standing outside of the store, like catcalling you and stuff. So I do like those social environments more than the other ones. For some people, they like a country, down home, inner city, urban type of lifestyle. I actually do like uh, an urban social environment as long as it's diverse. But I really do feel like a lot of women who have pretty privilege in particular, I feel like it's important to think about how you can get out of the social environments that are hindering you. So if you're surrounded by basic Bettys, how can you get out of it? If you are with toxic roommates, how can you get out of it? If you are living with jealous family members, how can you get out of it?
If you have a jealous boyfriend or a jealous spouse, how can you get out of that? If you have a child, let's say you are a single mom or something like that, how can you um, make sure that you set up the best lifestyle for yourself and for your child? But the reason that we see pretty women in higher end spaces more often than we see them in like low end spaces is because I do feel like a lot of pretty women have to social climb so that they can insulate themselves from those crabs in a bucket environments. And I know that people can have a crabs in a bucket mentality when they're rich, but at least when you're wealthy, you have the money to kind of isolate yourself and just kind of like go live on an island somewhere or go live, you know, you only stay in spaces with other people who are also leveled up. So maybe they're not as likely to try to make all these snide remarks and stuff about like you eating healthy because it's more of a cultural norm. Has, has anyone ever noticed that or am I the only one that notices that? It's more of a cultural norm in um, wealthy spaces or in spaces where a lot of people are into fitness and stuff. It's more of a cultural norm to eat healthy. So nobody's making fun of you and saying, oh, you eat like a rabbit. Oh, why don't you eat all of the chicken? People literally used to make fun of me at family cookouts because of the way that I eat chicken wings. They would say that I don't eat all the chicken off the bone. And it's like, just because I'm not over here sucking on chicken bones and like trying to suck every part of the meat off of there, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But I've noticed that if you go to a different social setting where it's the norm to eat lower qual quantities, it is the norm to eat healthier foods, it's going to be easier for you to thrive. So that's what I mean by social climbing. I mean getting out of the social settings that don't benefit you and then going into social settings that do benefit you. And this is why I will always be a big proponent of multiracial black women jumping in and out of blackness at will because you know what if people are going to push us in and out of blackness in and out of whiteness or whatever your other backgrounds are um you might as well use that to your advantage then you can use that fluid identity to your advantage so if you feel like you thrive more in a black environment when it comes to getting your hair done because maybe they know how to do your hair better then that's fine but then if you feel like you thrive better in a more Asian environment, let's say you're Blasian or something, when it comes to your Asian background, maybe you like the media, you like the K-pop, you like the K-dramas and stuff, and you like to go to those uh, concerts and all that, then you have the right to do that. Side note, I do not thrive at black hair places, I've noticed. I've realized that I socially do the best in Latin American hair places. I know a lot of people like to talk shit about the Latin community and they say that they put relaxers and stuff in their shampoos. I've never had that problem. Um, I haven't had to get a blowout in a long time, but even when it comes to where you get your hair done, where you get your uh, beauty treatments done, I've noticed that anytime an unambiguous black woman has tried to do my makeup at a makeup counter, she always makes my foundation look off. She always does it like too dark. And I don't know if it's because maybe there's a complex where people don't wanna look ashy or they don't wanna look like they're casket ready or whatever, but I've noticed that that's not the best way to have my makeup done. I, I work better when I just pick my own makeup for myself. So I thrive more when I socially isolate myself in terms of choosing what beauty items look best on me. Because there might be some areas of your social climbing journey where you work the best when you are isolating when you don't tell anybody about what your goals are, when you are just doing your business on your own and you're not including anybody in that. Like for example, with this YouTube channel, I work best when I do not tell people in my real life about this YouTube channel. My family doesn't know what this channel is. My brother doesn't know. My sister doesn't know. No, None of my friends in everyday life, they don't know about this channel because I don't want to harm the integrity of this channel. I don't want to start censoring myself because, oh, I have XYZ types of friends in real life and, you know, I don't want them to think negatively of me and judge me. No, I don't want to have to censor myself. So there are going to be some areas where it's like you just work better when you are isolating yourself. Another thing that I realized is that whenever I want to do a really hard workout, because I like workout classes, but if I want to do a workout that's like extra hard, I thrive more when I'm just by myself. So if I want to run 10 miles, I've noticed I can run 10 miles by myself. But then if my friends say, hey, do you want to run six miles? I'm going to be struggling. So that's what I'm talking about when I say social climbing. It is setting up your social life and setting up where you want to be in society, creating goals for 
how you want your social life to look, what socioeconomic status you want, what part of society do you like, what parts of society do you dislike, do you want to create your own culture? Because that's another thing I've realized too is that I work better when I'm innovating because I can use creativity as opposed to trying to follow somebody else's rules, trying to follow their social norms, trying to follow another culture. So that's why I've noticed that I work better when I'm when I'm not religious. I work better when I am not following what my family does. I work better when I'm not kind of following uh, trends on, you know, what are the other mixed race people doing? What are these people doing over here? I don't really work the best when I am in those types of environments. I work better when I'm innovating and then other people just come and, you know, collaborate or whatever. So that's something else that a lot of pretty privileged women can think about. Like, do I work, does my pretty privilege work better when I'm collaborating with someone else on my beauty? So for example, I depend on a hairstylist to make my hair look the best, or I depend on a makeup artist to match my foundation the best, or do I do a better job with my pretty privilege when I am just independently kind of determining what I want to look like? So for me in the past, when I was first learning about certain things, like learning how to do hair, learning how to do makeup, then yes, I worked better when other people were helping me. But then as I got better at hair and makeup and stuff, then I just decided that I work best when I'm isolating myself and just deciding for myself what I think looks pretty. Another thing that I want to talk about when it comes to social climbing is when it comes to status, like that's really what social climbing is. It is about trying to gain a higher social status. But the question is, what what does social status mean to you? Um, so I guess when I think of social, the word social, I don't just think of like my friends and family. I kind of think of like society as a whole. What do I want my status to be in society as a whole? Do I want to be another statistic? Do I want to be the girl who's poor and broke? Do I want to be the one who is at the bottom of society? Or do I want to be the successful person who kind of like breaks all of these stereotypes and I've been able to break barriers for myself and for others? Do I want to forge my own path? So that's what I mean when I say social climbing. The whole concept is not supposed to be about like harming other people or harming yourself. It's supposed to be where you tailor your own life and tailor your actions and your behaviors so that you can build a life for yourself that is exactly what you want. Because I've noticed that sometimes when women try to social climb via relationships with men, I'm not saying that that can't work um, because I think, I guess it depends on your goals, but it's like if that man does something bad or like something bad happens in your relationship, then what? All of your social climbing that you just did is now gone. Look at young Miami kind of hooking up with Diddy. So yes, at first she was probably like, oh wow, I'm getting all these gifts, I'm getting all this money, I get to have this podcast and stuff. But then once things turn bad, now her career is suffering because she tied her entire social climbing goals to somebody who ended up being like this bad person. And I know that's an extreme example. Most people aren't going to like seek out celebrities and stuff in order to build their social status. But I have noticed that a lot of women, they look to men as their main vehicle for social climbing, or they look to the male gaze as their main vehicle for social climbing. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can social climb and attain status or wealth or whatever your dreams are by using other skills like your your talents, your intelligence, your education, your business connections. Maybe you're good at being creative. You can utilize your creativity to express yourself in a way that gains positive attention. So one thing that I've realized is like, I've had to ask myself, what does social status mean to me? And also when it comes to being the pretty privileged girl in the workplace, is your pretty privilege even working for you in that workplace? Because I've noticed that for me, the pretty privilege did not work in the workplace unless there was some guy that was like trying to talk to me or like I wanted to talk to him or whatever. So it only worked if there was some guy around or if the women were not jealous, which in a lot of cases, the women did end up making snide remarks and stuff. Or sometimes I would deal with more negative stereotypes, like people thinking I'm just some bimbo or like, I definitely shouldn't be an accountant because, you know, I only got the job because somebody thought I was cute. That's the only reason I'm here. By the way, I was an accountant with no accounting degree. So you can imagine how that was. And I will say that I do think that the way I looked did help me to get my first accounting job because the director that was hiring, he was an unambiguous black man who had married a biracial woman. 
And so his daughter, he said he felt like I looked like his daughter and he would like compliment my looks and stuff like that. So I do think that could have helped me to get my foot in the door. But then I realized as time went on, like, okay, I don't actually want to do this for life. So you get to decide, like, how do I want to utilize my pretty privilege? Do I want to use it in the workplace to get hired? Do I want to use it so I can make friends? Because I've noticed women will bestow pretty privilege upon other women. If you tell a girl that, oh my God, you look so cute. I love your hair. I love your nails. I love your outfit. You just gave her pretty privilege. Pretty privilege just means you're giving someone extra attention. You are giving them like extra clout. You're giving them a sense of status in your mind because they are pretty. A lot of teachers do this with students. Like if you have a little girl in the class who's like, she's so cute. And then it makes you think of like, oh, this is how I looked when I was a little girl. You might be nicer to that little girl. So there are thousands of different ways people use their pretty privilege. One of the main ways that I like to use pretty privilege just and it helps me in every area is simply using it as a confidence and self-esteem booster. When I look in the mirror and I feel like I look beautiful outside of other people telling me just me feeling beautiful within myself I notice that it causes a side effect to where I naturally have more confidence just in general. So I'm not afraid to talk to people. I'm not afraid to like speak up for myself. I'm not afraid to make bolder moves and stuff. I'm not afraid to um, switch up my appearance. I've noticed I feel more carefree. I feel more ready to face the world and I just feel better in social situations in general because I'm not thinking about all of my insecurities. So pretty privilege, um, what that means to me is getting rid of the insecurities that make you feel ugly. So I like to call them micro insecurities. That's just a, a phrase that I made up. I was kind of thinking of, you know, that term microaggressions. So that's where I got it from, like micro insecurities. So it may not be a really big insecurity. Like you may not wake up thinking about the fact that you have a big nose, but maybe when you smile, Every time you smile, that thought is in the back of your head, oh, my nose is big, or maybe your teeth are like a little bit messed up, or you have some gaps or something. So when you're talking to a new person, you might be thinking, oh, crap, do my teeth look bad? Do they look yellow? Oh, can he see my gaps in my teeth? So what I've realized is that for me, pretty privileged just means I am getting rid of the micro insecurities. So I know that other people, they try to shame you for wanting to improve yourself. They try to shame you and say, well, you shouldn't be insecure about being obese. You should just love yourself as you are. You shouldn't be insecure about being a bald headed scallywag. You should just love yourself as you are. And it's like, no, some people do not love themselves when they feel like they are not at their best. I've noticed that I am more easily able to express my self love when I feel like I'm putting effort into myself. And it doesn't mean that I have to be trying to impress other people, but when I'm putting effort into my own appearance by removing the triggers, AKA removing those micro insecurities, yes, it does affect my confidence in general. And that is my favorite way to use pretty privilege is just to use it with myself. So when I look in the mirror, I feel like I'm pretty. And the way that I have tried to become prettier for lack of better words is like I said, if there's any insecurity that I have about my physical appearance, I will go out of my way to start working on it and start trying to eradicate it. And that's not me being shallow. That's actually me admitting my flaws. You know, the people who say you need to humble yourself. Okay. Well that is humbling yourself, isn't it? If you are admitting, Hey, my nose looks big or my teeth look messed up or, you know, I have acne or whatever. So I want to work on that. How can I train my facial muscles so that when I smile, my nostrils don't flare or my nose doesn't crinkle up or whatever? Like there are so many different things you can do to get rid of those micro insecurities. And so when I'm constantly working on making myself look better, it does make me think I'm cute. So for all the people who like to say, oh, she thinks she's cute. Yes, I do think I'm cute and I want to think that I'm cute. That's a good thing to think that you're cute. So if I look in the mirror and I am overweight, I am not going to think that I'm cute. So that's going to cause me to be insecure. On this channel, I like to deal in reality. So for all the people who like to be holier than thou and pretend like I don't have any insecurities, I just think I'm perfect or whatever. So I just wake up with like crusty lips and I still feel like a baddie. Okay, that's fine. Then go be a baddie with your crusty lips. But I like to spend time working on myself because Every time I get rid of a micro insecurity, that's one less thing that I have to worry about. So for example, 
if I am staying in shape, like I really like to have a flat stomach, like as flat as possible, looking snatched. Um, I like to have my abs be, well, my abs, they will never be visible because I have an hourglass, but I like my stomach to be as flat as possible. And that cures the micro insecurity of, is my stomach poking out when I'm wearing a crop top? Like I don't have that thought in my mind anymore because I have solved that insecurity. So the thing that I've noticed is that the less insecurities I have, the less cluttered my mind is. Because a lot of people, a lot of basic Bettys, they don't realize that part of why they didn't achieve their dreams is because they are flooded. They're basically drowning in thousands of micro insecurities. They're insecure about their looks, about their weight, about their race, about their background, their socioeconomic status, their relationship status, their lack of friendships, their personality. So they're already, they're drowning in so many insecurities. They have to solve so many different insecurities. They have to face and overcome so many different things before they can even declutter their mind enough to have the mental space to even think about, hey, how can I level up? Hey, what do I want to do with my life? Oh, actually, I'm passionate about fashion design. Maybe I want to start my own clothing store. They don't have time to think about clothing stores. They're already bogged down thinking about all the pimples on their face, how they've gained weight, how their husband left them, how he didn't pay child support. So they're their mind is cluttered. And so what I like about solving the micro insecurities is it actually declutters my mind. So that's one less thing that I have to think about. So yes, even if it's something small like painting my nails, I don't have to think about my nails anymore. I'm not thinking, oh crap, my nails are chipped. Oh my gosh, my fingernails are dirty. Oh, they look yellow. Oh my gosh, that's embarrassing. I'm not thinking those thoughts. So that's some mental space that I just freed up. And you guys know that I'm a big proponent of mental health and trying to remove the triggers. Insecurities are triggers. And yes, that includes micro insecurities. So for a lot of people who uh, they are jealous of like, let's say you're a mixed race black woman and people are jealous of you or they're jealous of your hair texture. It's not just that they're jealous of the hair texture. Usually there are a whole bunch of other insecurities underneath that. And that's what causes the visceral reaction. It's not that they're just jealous of a hair texture. They're jealous of you not having to spend five hours on a Saturday doing your wash day routine. You don't have to constantly go through setbacks in your hair length retention. Uh, you can wear any style and it looks natural. You can do the leave out and literally just wake up and wet your hair and it matches the, the weave that you're wearing. You don't have to think about on a date, oh, is my leave out looking bad right now? They're jealous of the fact that maybe you have more pretty privilege in that area or people pedestalize you. They're jealous of the pedestalization that you're receiving that they're not receiving. So they're thinking about how you probably go out and get people complimenting your hair. Meanwhile, they go out and then they're invisible or they spend all this time overdoing their hairstyles to the point where they're ripping out their hair and you're not spending your time doing that. So one thing that I've learned is that insecurities are kind of like the tip of the iceberg or it's kind of like you know how um, when you see a tall tree, you see that they have this entire root system underneath. I don't know if you guys have seen those graphs, but a lot of forests have a whole entire root system underneath. And I feel like a lot of insecurities are like that. So it's like the, the hair texture insecurity, that is just one leaf on the tree. You don't realize that you have hella other insecurities beneath that one. And once you solve the hair texture insecurity, there's going to be yet another insecurity that's going to come up underneath that. So a lot of people don't realize how much mental work is actually required to attain a solid sense of self-esteem. And this is why you see women who are pretty or they look pretty on the outside, but then they still have horrible self-esteem. It's because they only solved the surface level insecurities. They only solved you know, the hair texture insecurity. They didn't solve why they had that insecurity in the first place and what it was based on. And this is exactly why I have a Decentering Men series because once I went on my Decentering Men journey, about 90% of my surface level insecurities instantly went away because I no longer had to worry about, oh, well, you know, what if my body doesn't look like a perfect hourglass anymore? Am I going to get treated differently? Treated differently by who? Oh, by men. Oh, how am I going to look in the bedroom now if like I lose weight and I look super skinny? How do you look in the bedroom in front of who? In front of a man. Oh, what if like the trends change and then like when I take pictures, it no longer looks as good on social media and then like nobody likes it. What do you mean by nobody likes it? Who's nobody? Who is the nobody that you want to like the pics? Oh, it's men. 
So for a lot of women, they don't realize that all of those micro insecurities they have, they are actually just a symptom of a larger problem. And this is why I say that you're not ugly, you're just poor, or you're not ugly, you hate your ethnicity. And that's the root of why you think you're ugly. I try to get, I try to go deeper than just the surface level insecurities, or when people say uh, Blue Ivy is ugly or Jay-Z is ugly, or they name all of these people with broad features like Ice Spice, and they say that they're ugly. No, you just hate African features. You hate broad-faced Africans. That's what you don't like. So that's why you say LMI is ugly. You don't like big noses. You think big noses are uglier than small noses. And by the way, I'm not shaming anybody for whatever their personal beauty standard is for themselves, but it's important to be able to answer those questions within yourself because then you are preventing cognitive dissonance. I talk a lot about how cognitive dissonance leads to anxiety, it leads to people being depressed, and obviously if you are a walking, living, breathing hypocrite 24-7, yeah, you're going to have a hard time having a sense of self-esteem. So if you don't admit to yourself that you think broad features are ugly, but then you have a face full of broad features, yeah, it's going to be hard for you to feel confident even if you do learn how to do makeup because you never admitted the truth to yourself, which was that you prefer a smaller nose and you have a big nose, so you hate your nose. So now you have two options, either change your beauty standard, which most people actually won't do, so that's one thing. So either change your beauty standard, um, admit to yourself, I will always have an ugly nose because that's what you thought was ugly, or you have to change your nose. And yes, that is a very difficult uh, conversation to have within yourself. It is very difficult to admit to yourself, oh wait, I actually think that XYZ features are ugly and I have those features. So now what? Now what do I want to do? Do I want to just admit to myself that I think XYZ women with those features are prettier than me? Or do I want to change myself to become that person that I was once jealous of? And there is no wrong answer. Like I said, I'm not shaming anybody because you can't help how you were born. And also another question that I've had to ask myself when it comes to pretty privilege is, what do I think is pretty and why? And by the way, there is no wrong answer. So for example, um, I think that having a small chest and being very, very skinny is pretty. Why? Well, I, I think part of it is because I was born with more of an hourglass shape. So no matter how skinny and tiny my waist gets, I still will have, you know, a little booty, little boobies or whatever. And I feel like my personality goes better with being extremely thin. So I learned that that is my internal beauty standard. So a lot of people, they have told me my whole life, oh, you have such a perfect body. Like you should uh, accentuate your boobs. You should accentuate your butt because it's like when you accentuate it, then it looks like the perfect size. You know, it, it looks like little curves or whatever, but that didn't make me feel good because deep down inside, my personal standard of beauty for myself was something different. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, not everything that you think is beautiful is going to fit popular beauty standards. So I, I realized my beauty standard for myself for body is being model thin or being like just very skinny in general because I really liked it. I liked the experience when I was at my skinniest because I liked how I could eat whatever I wanted. I never got fat. Like I literally, this is really bad, but I didn't work out for like years. I didn't work out consistently for years and I stayed skinny. For a very long time. So I liked that. I also liked being able to buy the cheap clothes and stuff and then they all look perfect on me. I liked it when my body looked like a mannequin because when I would go to the stores and stuff or when I would look at stuff on the hanger, the clothes looked like how they did on the hanger. They looked exactly like that on me. So I liked the consistency of, okay, if I get this $15 dress, it's gonna look exactly like that on me, like how it looks on the mannequin. So I liked that experience and it's okay to admit that to myself. No, I'm not saying that having, you know, thick thighs and all that is ugly. I'm not saying that having boobs and all that is ugly, but I had to look within myself and ask myself, what do I want to look like and why? If men didn't exist, how would I look? And I also had to ask myself the same question when it came to what I think is ugly. Because a lot of people are very disingenuous and they don't want to admit when they think something is ugly. But the bottom line is everybody thinks that somebody is ugly. Or they have kind of this hierarchy in their minds of this body type looks the prettiest, this hairstyle and color looks the prettiest. And then, you know, inevitably something is going to end up at the bottom. So for example, for me, when I was thinking about my body standards, 
yes, being overweight and looking like a refrigerator, that was at the bottom for me personally. I don't feel good about myself if I look anywhere close to that. And I'm not trying to throw shade against you if you are like overweight or whatever. I just noticed that that happened to not be my top priority for like how I wanted to look. And it's okay to admit that to myself. As long as you're not out publicly bashing people because they look different than what you think they should look like, then I'm fine. Like I don't care if you don't think that MLS women are pretty or whatever. Just don't come on my channel calling us ugly though. And don't try to convince other people that we are ugly because now I feel like it's getting into more of this social climbing sort of thing where it's like you're trying to social climb by spreading rumors, you know, spreading negative rumors about, oh, mixed women are ugly and I Spice and women who look like her, they're ugly. I wouldn't do that because that's not my social climbing method. I don't feel the need to actively talk about how ugly someone else is in order to make myself feel prettier. But no matter what you look like, there are going to be pros and cons to that look when it comes to social climbing. This is why a lot of celebrities, they will change their hair, they'll change their eye colors, they'll change even their skin tones, they will change their uh, faces and bodies, you know, get surgeries, Botox, fillers, or whatever, depending on what their social climbing goals are for that point in their career. So a lot of people like to shame celebrities and they'll say, oh, why did she get all this filler? Why did she get all these nose jaws? Why did she do that? Well, obviously there's a reason she did it. She did it because she felt like it would help her in her career or she felt like, you know, this is how I feel looks the best or this is what I feel looks best and aligns most with my social climbing goals. So for some women, like, I don't know if you guys saw those pictures of Gabrielle Union, how she just totally effed up her face. Well, I won't say she effed it up, but she just put a whole bunch of fillers or something in her face to where it just looks unrecognizable. And her social climbing goals are probably to look young or probably to like, I don't know, stay relevant or compete with these younger like people and stuff. I've heard Gabrielle Union talk about her insecurities with her age. So she seems to be trying to get rid of those micro insecurities maybe about some wrinkles she had in her face. I didn't see any wrinkles, but maybe she had wrinkles. But everybody has a different beauty standard for themselves. Everybody has different social climbing goals. So for some women, they want to use their pretty privilege to look as young as possible so that they can, you know, have the benefits of a young pretty woman. Some women want to look more mature and more elegant and they want to be treated more like adults. Like you guys have seen a lot of those Disney stars where, you know, they're upset with being treated like a kid or only being associated with like Disney and Nickelodeon. So a lot of them will try to push their sex appeal to the next level or, you know, they try to do all these crazy things so that they can be seen in the public eye as more of an adult. That is their social climbing goal in that moment. It's to be seen as being the sexy girl. That's their goal. Everybody's going to have different goals and I'm not shaming people for whatever their goals are. That's why on this channel, I'm very pro do what you want with your body, with your face, with your privilege stacking and level up journey. You have a right to use whatever privileges you may have already had. So if you have financial privilege, like let's say you were born rich, well, you get to use that to your advantage. Those are the cards that you were dealt or those are the cards that are in your hand right now. So you get to use that. Let's say you're really young right now. You're only in your early 20s. You have a perfect body and stuff. You get to use that privilege however you want to. But getting back to the whole pretty girls not working nine to five thing, I feel like a lot of women who have given up their power or they've lost their inner sense of power, they want to try to take away yours. And for a lot of women, they're not used to being in close proximity to pretty women because they have no social life, you know, they're not pretty themselves or their friends and family members are also not pretty. So for a lot of people, they don't know how to react to your beauty. And some people have a natural tendency to want to sabotage your beauty because they don't like how it makes them feel to kind of be in the background when they're in your presence. They don't really like that. They don't want to feel like they are the second best. They don't want to be reminded of what they used to look like. Have you ever noticed the women who they kind of look like you, but maybe they're like an older, fatter version, or maybe they're like the decrepit looking version of you. I'm not trying to be mean, but I have noticed that some women... It could be your own parent. You know, this is why some women, they have like jealous mothers or a jealous sister or a jealous family members, or they have a fellow woman of color in the workplace who wants to hinder them and hold them back because you are a direct competition to who they used to be. 
And every time they look at you, they are reminded of how they used to look and how they wasted their beauty on Dusties and how they, they never utilized their own skills to become who they wanted to be. They gave up on getting their college degree and stuff. They gave up on their dreams because they gave their life away to some guy or they just wasted all of their time. They spent their time chasing after things that didn't exist. And so that's why they're triggered when they see you. But what do you ladies think? What are your social climbing goals? What are your pretty privilege goals? And how are you going to keep working on them? Let me know what you think in the comment section and I'll talk to you next time. Stay pretty ladies.